Baku, a breath to spark the human heart. Welcome friends and family, you're here with me, Mark Philpot, and this is the Baku Podcast. Yep, we're doing it again. Sitting here in the living room, got a tangle of cables all around me. I've got a bunch of ideas, I've got some notes here. It's just stuff, stuff, and I'm here and I want to create something, you know? It's been a while. You might be asking, what's the story? Where have you been? What's been going on? And uh, if you see me regularly, you might have asked that question. And to be honest, I've been pretty vague, pretty vague about it. Because uh, I'm in a bit of a, an interesting space, a bit of a liminal space, a bit of an in-between space, a bit of a space between what was and what's next. And I think this is part of what next. But have you ever had something on your mind, something on your heart that you really wanted to do, that you really wanted to create, but you just couldn't quite get it out? You kept getting stuck. You get that little lump in your throat that every time you try to talk, you try to articulate what you're really feeling, it just gets caught up and stuck in something and you won't let it out. Or that little knot in your stomach that says, just not now, not yet. And I'm learning to understand that those little feelings, those intuitive feelings, they matter. They matter. They mean something. They tell us something about where we're at in ourselves, in our heart, in our spirit, in our emotions. And when we pay attention to that, perhaps we start to move in the direction we're supposed to be moving in. And that's where I'm sitting at the minute. So I'm sitting here. I've got some notes. I've got some ideas. Um, previously, for the Barco podcast, I was sitting down and I was writing and I was scripting and, and crafting each episode piece by piece uh, to the point where it was quite laborious um, and it was quite rigid. Before I'd sit down to speak, I had every word on the page and I knew where we were starting I knew there was a middle, I knew there was an end, there were some takeaway points. And it was a good way to do things. It was the way I've been trained to do things. It's the way that for a long time I felt I should do things. But something in me has changed and I feel like right now it's time to be a bit loose, just to let things go a little bit. Not to say I haven't prepared, I haven't thought about this, I have. I've done a lot of thinking and playing with these ideas but I haven't sat down to really write it out like an essay. Because in reading an essay, in reading something that's pre-prepared, you lose that space that comes in a conversation. When we go to have coffee with a friend, we don't don't script out what we'd like to say to that person before we get there. We go and we, we just let it flow. We let it out. We see where the conversation takes us. And so there's... Next couple of podcasts, I'm going to play in that space. We're just going to let it happen. We're going to let it flow. We're going to see where it takes us. And the idea I've had is to pick a parable or a proverb or one of each, as I've got for today, and to pick it apart and just see where that proverb or that parable takes us because life is full of stories. In our house at the moment, Jed's been absolutely loving story time. He'll sit down with his Lego, he'll put on story time and he'll listen to story after story after story and they're really well read, they're really well crafted. All these kids' stories with, the, with actors reading them with, with the voices and, and the sound effects and some music in there and you can see he just, he's transported to a different place because a good story creates space for us to work ourselves out. Hearing somebody else's story, whether it's fiction, whether it's, whether it's biographical, whether it's something that happened or didn't happen, it creates a play area for our imaginations to run wild, to experiment with our identity and to start to think about what fits with our experience, what jars with our experience, what's true in terms of our understanding of the world 
from what we know, from what we've experienced, from what we've heard, from what we believe, and perhaps what what isn't true or, or what is not helpful. <coughs> so today, I've got a couple of stories that I'd like to share. And the first one, the first one, it's actually a parable that comes from comes from the New Testament of the Bible. And when you hear that, I know for a lot of people, we, we hear these stories for the first time in a specific place, in a specific time, in a specific context. And how we hear those stories for the first time often colours our relationship that we have with those stories. So growing up, I remember hearing a lot of these stories for the first time as a a little kid going along to church with my parents and the church was an old church it was called St James down in Mount Waverley it was across the road from the hospital where I was born and I remember going along Sunday after Sunday and that context that place it evoked a particular feeling in me as a, a young child to begin with I didn't like the clothes that I had to wear to go to church on a Sunday because wearing your Sunday best was still kind of a thing. And I remember my mum had this pair of jeans that she used to put me in. And I didn't like how they felt. I liked my tracky pants, but I was told tracky pants weren't okay for Sunday morning church. So to begin with, I had this, this uncomfortable, uneasy feeling with that context. And the building itself, well, the building itself, I didn't mind the building. I liked the building. There was a sense of awe in the building. It had these big ornate ceilings carved out of timber, tall cathedral ce- ceilings that led up to a big bell tower at the front. And the old bell would ring from time to time on Sundays to, s- to signify the start of worship or perhaps more excitingly on a wedding. And they could be heard from all around. And there were the stained glass windows And there were the little timber pews, polished timber pews in rows with the little tray at the back that held the Australian prayer book, a Bible and a hymn book. And also these green velvet covered kneeling cushions. So it was a space that had reverence, but it wasn't comfortable. There were no cushions on the pews. So to sit was an uncomfortable experience. There was a sense of kneeling which created that sense of insignificance, which can be helpful, but without completely understanding it, the whole space just felt a bit uncomfortable. And then there were the ways that the stories were told. And often when the stories were told, just like a lot of the liturgy that was repeated from week to week, there was a really monotonous, boring sort of tone that came with the readings of these these quite wonderful stories, these poetic stories, these stories of about life. But sometimes, depending on who was reading, there was a tradition and a culture of adopting this almost just a monotone as these stories were read from the front. And I understand... The first hearing, the first time you hear a story colours your perception of your relationship with that story, with that book. And also the strings that are attached. What are you supposed to think about these stories? What are you supposed to believe about the elements in this story? But over time and over many years, from Sunday school to a youth group in a different church, to studying at theological college, to working in a church, to stepping out of the church completely and not picking up a Bible for a good 10 years, really. The relationship's changed, the context has changed and I've had space between what was and what's becoming to start to reimagine these texts and to start to discover them new because a little bit of space and distance from a text, from a person, from an institution. Sometimes what we need just to to clarify our perspective, to create space to, 
to allow a new perspective to come alive within us. And that's starting to come to fruition for me at the moment. And that's what I'll be sharing with you. So this little parable that I've chosen today, in fact, before I get to that parable, another quote, another proverb I came across this week, which had me quite excited, actually. Uh, I've been reading this book called Muay Thai, Peace at Last by Michael Goodison. And it's a journal of an Australian fellow who travels over to Thailand and he lives in a backpacker's hostel for about five weeks while preparing for a professional Muay Thai fight. And it journals his, his, uh, his partying as he lives in the backpacker's hostel. Uh, it journals his, his training sessions uh, and also mixes in quite a, quite a good dose of his personal philosophies about life, about courage, about adventure, about, about finding personal meaning and growth. Which, um, which has been a great read. And as I looked into where Michael's actually come from, I had a look at his website, and um, one of the quotes that um, jumped out at me from the, one of the pages was um, this Latin proverb. And it goes something like this. It says, If the wind will not serve, take to the oars. If the wind will not serve, take to the oars. And we can imagine... Perhaps uh, in days gone by, before we had uh, the luxury of motorboats and we were at the mercy of the seas, a big ship may have had big sails that could take it sailing across the ocean. But sails were limited because you had to work with the conditions. You had to work with the direction of the wind. And if the wind wasn't going in the direction that perhaps you thought you wanted to be going in. The other option was to get your crew on the oars and to power your way against the wind, against the current, to where you needed to be. It's a beautiful picture of the way life can go in two different directions. We can take one road or one We can choose one energy source. We can choose the energy source of the wind in our sails, which is easier in terms of harnessing that energy. certainly easier. We can set our sails up and basically recline on the deck and enjoy the ride. Or we can pick up the oars. We can put in our own effort and we can strive and we can struggle and we can push And we can get to our destination that way. And neither of these two options are necessarily absolutely better than the other. There are particular circumstances where perhaps there is a bit of a storm and to avoid complete disaster, we do need to pick up the oars. We do need to put in some effort to avoid becoming shipwrecked. But when we keep that up for too long, and this is my experience, absolutely, when we push against the wind, when we push against the energy flow in our lives, eventually we're going to become distressed. Beautiful picture we've got of stress is this, um, the concept of all stress versus distress. All stress is good. All stress is the sort of stress that we need in our lives so that we continue to to grow, to be healthy, to develop stronger muscles. We stress ourselves just enough to start to break down that muscle tissue, just enough to break down some old beliefs or opinions, some patterns in our thinking, just enough so that they can be broken down and then grow back a little bit stronger. Because without stress in our lives we become stagnant. And becoming stagnant is not particularly helpful either. But then if that stress is sustained for too long, if we keep rowing against the tide, if we keep rowing against the direction of the flow of that, the wind in our lives, for too long, our muscles will eventually fatigue. And if we ignore that feeling of fatigue, if we ignore that feeling of becoming distressed, 
then eventually we'll become injured. And if we become injured, we're absolutely at the mercy of the seas. So that's just a little a proverb there that caught my attention this week. Um, out of reading that book, Muay Thai Peace at Last. Great read. Um, resonates with me particularly at the moment. My sister bought it for me for my birthday um, because I've been in this extra space I've had. I've had a fair bit of extra space. I haven't mentioned that yet, but I've had a fair bit of extra space for the last few months because I actually left my, my job where I was working. It was a plum job. I was working at the local high school as the student wellbeing leader, a role which I had coveted since the day we moved to Torquay or perhaps even before we moved to Torquay, to be honest. I thought, yeah, that job looks like the spot for me. That's the school for me. The space felt good when I first walked in there um, and met the principal when they're on the old campus. It felt good. I thought, yeah, this is somewhere I can see myself. And it took about six years to, to find myself in that role. And it was a good role. And pretty quickly it turned from a contract position into an ongoing contract, which in the education department is like the golden ticket. Once you have an ongoing contract... It's like a job for life. There's almost nothing you can do to lose that job. Almost, almost nothing. And for, for some of the teachers who I've met, they've tried. <laughs> they've really tried to lose that. But um, it's very, very difficult to, um, to be pushed out once you're on that ongoing contract. So there's a lot of security there. The pay, the pay is actually reasonable. It's, it's, it's good. Um, the conditions were good. I had a lovely office, lots of light, a window. It's quite private couches for kids to come and sit on and and share their concerns. Uh, The community was good and supportive. The teaching staff were lovely. I really enjoyed being there. And it felt like a good place to be. And it was comfortable and a lot of good relationships have come through that experience. But towards the end of last year, unfortunately, I got to a point where I just kept getting sick and it started with sinus infections. Sinus has always been a bit of a weakness of of mine. Um, But then it started to get weird. And when I started to get weird, the the infection started to come on pretty quick and pretty directly correlated to, um, to times when I'd have to take a pretty heavy disclosure from a young person. And I think what was happening was on a cognitive level, on a mind level, I was pushing myself through every day. I knew what to do. I knew how to handle the situations. I knew what resources were available to help and how to connect parents, families, young people with these resources to help. But on an emotional level, there was a lot of stuff building up. There was a lot of sadness building up, a lot of grief building up about the state of about the state of these young people's lives and the state of society and that this was happening and I understand there's a bias there when that's your job is to meet people in these situations then you're meeting maybe 10% of the community throughout the year yet um, if that's the only 10% that you spend 90% of your time with then you, you, you're right you, your bias your, um, the way that you see the world becomes skewed towards that that um, towards that end of the spectrum where people are really struggling. You start to think that everybody's struggling. And of course they're not. But when you sit in it day in, day out, then that's what it feels like. So energetically I was pretty drained. And then it moved from the sinuses to other peculiar illnesses, rashes, heart palpitations, weird stuff going on. So... Eventually, I got to a point where I had to I had to let go. I had to put down my oars and stop rowing upstream. And it was a hard decision to make because I, I really I really like being in that place. I like the people. It was the job I'd always wanted. Uh, it was the goal I'd set for myself. And I had to eat a whole lot of humble pie, really. By saying, you know what, I can't do this under my own steam anymore. And in fact, perhaps, 
perhaps as much as I don't want to admit it, as as much as I don't want to uh, to move out into the uncertainty, into the unknown, into not knowing what's next, perhaps it's time to let go. And so I did. So I've had a bit of extra time. And in that extra time, one of the great things that has come out of being part of that school community for me is actually the relationship that I've been um, fortunate to develop with the Muay Thai and MMA gym here in Torquay. And I've spoken about this before, but I've really been throwing myself into the training and loving how that's been feeling. I've loving being feeling fit, probably for the first time in my life, actually fit enough to run and fit enough to... Um, <laughs> to do things that I couldn't for a very long time. My core's feeling good. My stability's feeling pretty good. I've ironed out a lot of the niggles in um, my body over the last year or so. And I've put my name down to, to actually amp up the training a little bit for a little fight camp we're doing here as part of the gym. Uh, for people who aren't real fighters like myself, but who would like to play in that space and come to understand a little bit of what it might be like to train like a real fighter. So for that last four, four weeks, four and a half weeks now, we've been undergoing a bit of a, a fight camp where we've been training a few extra times a week, a little extra sparring, a couple of strength and conditioning classes, a little more running. Um, and it's been really fun. And reading this book alongside that has been a great experience. So thanks to my sister for, for getting me onto that book. And having this book, this story to read alongside my own personal experience has been um, a cool space to, to sit in. Because like I was talking about at the beginning, stories create space for our imaginations to play out, to see what fits with our identity, where, what's, what's possible for us as a human, what philosophies gel with our experience, with our thinking, and what perhaps jars or doesn't quite sit right. So some of the stories that have been quite influential for me over the years um, are definitely parables, the stories that Jesus told or, or the stories that the people who wrote the Gospels chose to put into Jesus' mouth, which, which is equally as possible when you understand where these texts are coming from. And either way, it doesn't really matter to me whether the they were spoken firsthand or whether they've been doctored a little bit and tidied up and made a little more palatable, a little more poetic. If there's some artistic license there, that's not a problem for me. I quite actually quite like that because that's what, um, that's what life's about. That's what gives us permission to tell our stories and to, to create new stories. So the story, the parable that I picked for today, and I'll read it out of Matthew's Gospel. It appears in a couple of the synoptic Gospels. But it's about a tree and its fruit. And in Matthew's Gospel, we've got Jesus talking uh, in a sermon here where he's quite happily telling stories. And this one jumped out at me this week. And it says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit you'll recognise them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit you will recognise them. We've got wolves, we've got sheep, We've got clothes, we've got fruit, we've got thistles, we've got three trees being cut down and thrown into the fire, all in this short space of about two paragraphs. And it's poetic and there's some truth in this story that I want to tease out today. The idea of false prophets, because what's a prophet? What is a prophet? When I was younger, when we think about prophets, we thought about people who had like a special power and particularly a special power to perhaps foresee what might happen in the future. You know, that was the way I saw it as a kid, certainly. Somebody who could, who could, through divine 
inspiration somehow tell us what was going to happen next. And there's something alluring about that. But if we break it down, what prophet really means is somebody who speaks with divine inspiration. And inspiration being somebody who speaks with a sense of spirit inside them. And we can all do that. We all have something that we're enthusiastic about. Enthusiasm. Another word that comes from the Greek root word which means to be inspired or possessed by God. When we hear somebody speaking enthusiastically with energy, with life in what they're saying, they're inspired, then that's prophetic. And it's not something that happens out there or that only a few people can do. It's something that we can all do. So this parable about the the false prophets, when we hear a story like that, we have a tendency to cast ourselves on a particular side of that story. And I'll give you an example. As a kid, when I was five or six, I remember sitting for hours with a little cassette, a little Panasonic cassette player by my side, and I had a copy of Robin Hood. It was one of those golden books with the turn the page thing. So I had a little red cassette tape that you pop in your cassette deck, you rewind it, and you hit play, and at the end of each page there was the chime that would let you know to turn the page. I'd spend hours sitting there listening to this book, turning the pages, looking at the pictures, not being able to read myself yet. And then I'd go outside, I'd beg mum for one of her tea towels and a couple of safety pins to pin to my to pin the the tea towel to my collar. And she'd made me a little green felt hat with a red feather in it that I'd stick on my head. I'd take a piece of bamboo which had been bent over on itself with a string tied to either end that my grandfather had created for me as a bow and arrow. And I'd head out into the backyard and I'd climb trees and I'd imagine that I was Robin Hood out there stealing from the rich to give to the poor. And we have a tendency when we hear stories to cast ourselves as the heroes. We want to be on the winning side. So when we hear stories about false prophets, particularly in the context of a church, nobody wants to think of themselves as the false prophet. There are always somebody else out there, somebody outside the institution who might be trying to lead us astray, who might be trying to lead us away from what we must be getting right. Because... The mind loves to be right and the collective conscious of a group of people, an institution, loves to be right. And we don't like to hear things that challenge our opinions. But a little bit of challenge can be good. It can help us. So what happens when we cast ourselves, when we have the courage to cast ourselves, On the other side of this story, what does it mean for us to be a false prophet, a wolf in sheep's clothing? What does that feel like? What happens when we start to speak and it's coming from a place not of enthusiasm and inspiration, but a place of fear, of compliance? of needing to toe the line, perhaps, in a situation that doesn't quite fit. Earlier this year, a friend of mine, who I worked with years ago in Glen Waverley, invited me along to a weekend where he was sharing a bit about a new program that he was developing, a rites of passage program for young people. And this guy who I have a lot of respect for. I was really excited about this program and I went along to hear more about it, to be part of this weekend. And I drove, I think it was about three, three and a half hours from Torquay all the way around to Phillip Island, leaving at some ungodly hour in the morning, around four in the, four in the morning, picking up a Macca's coffee um, about the halfway point to keep me going. 
and then stopping again at Macca's in Cranbourne to grab another coffee and a bacon and egg McMuffin so that I could arrive for for the first session of the day, which was starting at around, around 7.30 in the morning. So I was pumped. I was excited. I was going in with a positive attitude that, yeah, this is a good thing to be a part of. I want to be a part of this. And I already had these visions and ideas for where this program could go in our local community here in Geelong. But over the course of the weekend, I found this resistance building up in me. And it was because the foundation of the program clearly had a religious underpinning. There was this concept of God and the the language of God, which was clearly a Christianese sort of language being used, that I just kept feeling this resistance to because it wasn't something that I could talk about or sell in the context of my role at the school. Because in the context I was working in, in the context of a lot of things in our world at the moment, we have this idea that we should be able to pick up our oars and row against the wind. We should be able to move against the tide to push towards the designated destination. And for young people, there was this perception that if somebody wasn't doing okay, we just need to row a bit harder to get them out of that spot. We just need to to work a bit more to pour some more resources into it to get them through that tough spot, to get them to that place, that destination. And often that destination was more about us as a community, the people around them, the parents, the teachers, the wellbeing workers, the psychologists, feeling better about ourselves knowing that that person was now safe and secure than it really was about what was best for that young person. So something about going with the wind and being okay to sit and wait for the wind when everything goes still and quiet or waiting for the storm to pass us by It carries a lot of wisdom. And it's central, it's really central to the to the themes that we find in the Bible, in the story of Jesus. In fact, the Greek word for spirit, pneuma, pneuma. Think of our word for pneumatic, which is air-powered. Pneuma, spirit, it's all about air, breath, wind, the unseen force that acts upon all things. But there's a degree of uncertainty that we must first be comfortable with before we can trust that the wind is taking us where we need to be. And that that jars with the central narrative that's being sold to us at the moment that jars with the you can create your own destiny you can set your goals and you can go for it and you can you know what and you can for a time row upstream but if you haven't taken the time first to sit and be silent and to listen to that spirit to that voice inside you can end up wasting a whole lot of energy rowing in the wrong direction. And sometimes, sometimes we start out with the wind in our sails. Sometimes we start out heading with the flow of the energy in our lives. We end up working towards that destination and it's good and it resonates with who we are. It resonates with our passions. It fills us with enthusiasm and inspiration. But then the wind starts to starts to fade, it starts to die off. Perhaps it even starts to blow against us a little. And so we pick up our oars and we start pushing. And we push and we push. 
and we start to fatigue. And if we don't listen to our bodies, to our minds, to our souls, to our hearts, things start to break down pretty quick. We start to get sick. Things will start to fall apart around us. So how do we know? How do we know when we're speaking from that place, when we're not a false prophet anymore, when we're not the wolf in sheep's clothing, when we're not driving the party line to preserve some sense of false confidence or belief in our own strength? How do we know? Well, the second part of this proverb this um, parable that I'm sharing today is about the fruits of good trees and the fruits of the bad trees. Because a good tree can only produce good fruit and a bad tree can only produce bad fruit. When we think about spiritual fruits. I think they come to us in some of Paul's writings about the fruits of the Spirit. He says the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits that you'll be known by as a good prophet, A love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. It's not a bad list. They're good things. They're things I'd like to be identified with. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And when we're not in tune with that, Some of the things we might notice are our patience, particularly for me, my patience just starts to slip with the people around me, with myself. I start to have less to offer, less goodness, less kindness, less love, and I certainly feel less joyful. So how do we get back there? How do we get to that place of being good and fruitful? And this par- this parable, of course, it finishes by saying that every bad tree will be ripped out and thrown in the fire, which is a perfect line if you want to pe- preach about fire and brimstone and the fiery depths of hell, then that's a ripper. You know, you could really go to town on that, saying how those people were going to be condemned and thrown out into the fire and burned up. But it's not about alienating people. What I get when I read that is that fire has the capacity to purge the landscape. And fire is nothing without spirit because it Fire needs oxygen and air to breathe. In Australia here, we think about a bushfire ripping along the countryside. It creates its own little weather pattern. And there's currents in the air moving and pushing. And it grows in power and strength as it rips across through the bushland. Destroying everything in its path. Everything in its path. But out of that, out of those big fires, comes new growth. We were down at Wilson's prom just a week ago while Tilly was doing a massive um, trail run, 47 k's in a day, which is crazy. Some people were doing 100 k's in a day, which is even more crazy. But while we were down there, I was just struck by how beautiful the place was. The first time I went to the prom, it wasn't long after a bushfire had been through and the whole place had been burnt out and there were just charred sticks standing in the ground. No leaves, no tone, no contrast, just sticks of charcoal in the ground. But a lot of our plants here in Australia, they need the occasional fire to tear through so that their seeds can open up 
and sprout. They actually depend on the smoke to regenerate and to regrow. So looking at the prom while we were down there, it just struck me that all of this had been destroyed not that long ago. I think it must be maybe 10 years ago now. It's a little while ago. But it's all grown back with a new vigour, with new colours, in a new arrangement. There's a new balance in the undergrowth that would have been impossible without those fires. And it strengthens a lot of those native plants at the expense of many of the weeds that could have been there. So yeah, the fire, while it sounds scary, sometimes that fire is what we need just to burn up anything false that might be wanting to speak up and direct us in our lives. Because the fire and the wind work hand in hand. So that's it. I think that's it. That's the parable. So this week as you go out to whatever you're doing, I'd love you to just pay a little bit of attention if you think it'll help you. Just thinking about what's the truth in this for me? Am I inspired? Is there enthusiasm here? Is there still love and passion for what I do and for the people around me? Or am I rowing upstream? Am I going with the energy flow? Do I have the wind in my sails? Do I need to wait? Do I need to pause? Do I need to redirect? Or do I need to keep rowing? Because only you really know. I hope you have a great week. And I'll be back here speaking again soon on the Baku Podcast. It's been a pleasure.